you are listening to Take Charge Podcast, host by Anthony Joseph. Dr. Anand, as usual, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you for having me as usual, Anthony. New gaming regulation will boost the real estate market. We've all seen this title last week and all of the news and all of the articles. Explain it for us, please. Okay. Uh, I think what's going to be really good about the gaming that's going to come into the UAE is that a regulatory authority has been set up. It's called the GCGRA. It's the General Commercial Gaming Regulatory Authority. Now, it's going to be based in Abu Dhabi, but it's going to be governing all commercial gaming activities and casinos come into that category. So while the authority operates from Abu Dhabi, every ruler of each emirate will be given the freedom to decide if he wants to have that in his emirate or not. This is the initial things that we know about the regulatory authority. Why it's going to be a good thing, uh, and particularly for real estate, is because this is going to be a massive boost to the tourism sector, Mm -hmm. which is something that Dubai has grand plans for. Now, when the tourism sector is booming, it will naturally mean that retail is going to boom. Malls will start coming up, food and beverage options, entertainment zones, and therefore, you're also going to get a premium coming on real estate investment. So, while the casinos will attract its own revenue flow for uh, Dubai, as for the UAE as a city, it is going to definitely impact real estate. What I love about the concept here is, Dubai has been setting up regulatory authorities for everything that can govern real estate. We started with RIRA in 2007. Was all things real estate, you have a regulatory agency yeah. to monitor it. When crypto started becoming a big worldwide, we now have VARA, which is Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority. So Dubai is one of the most friendly cities that accept payments for real estate using crypto. So I, we've got regulatory authorities so that transparency is there, safety and security, reputation of the city attached to clean money coming in is going to be protected. And now you have when gaming is coming in, which is another place where people might look to put a lot, offload a lot of money, but there's going to be a regulatory authority in place to monitor that. So the good thing about Dubai going forward, or rather the UAE going forward is, even with new initiatives coming in, they're putting the controls in place. They're having regulatory governmental bodies and authorities that are going to monitor it to build the confidence of global markets into coming into it. So the regulatory authority for gaming is going to be absolutely brilliant. Now that it's officially out there, I think you're going to see casinos not just in uh, Dubai, Ras Al Khaimah, Abu Dhabi would be making announcements soon. Places like Ajman, all of these places could be speculating these. You're going to see a lot of this coming up very soon. So hopefully we're going to see the seven Emirates booming uh, because everyone has its own special charm, you know. And so once we see it all booming, we will be sure that UAE staying on top of the map see, and everything. I mean, definitely. If you look at what happened when we had the early real estate boom till 2008, there was the offshoot of that with Shusharja that benefited from it. So all the Emirates being so close to each other, yeah. there's naturally going to be a value add to the other. So it's definitely going to go up. And if you look at most of the cities in the world where casinos have been around or, or commercial gaming, where basically money is exchanged for what you do, uh, you've seen a lot of boost in those areas, real estate, tourism, look at Las Vegas, look at Miami, look at Macau. So we're going to see a combination of, I believe Dubai is going to be a nice mix of all of that. But the vision that this city has is much bigger than that of a Macau or a Miami or a Las Vegas. So I think in the next five to 10 years, this is going to be a completely different city that you're going to be living Definitely in. They cannot possibly agree more with you. I was doing a research to see what kind of liquidity it will be in the, in the city and in, in Dubai especially by the vision of 2040. $8.7 trillion. That's the vision. Makes me wonder, where are we at today? Do you have any idea about that number of liquidity that we have in the city? Uh, I couldn't give you an exact number on that, but I know Roughly. that probably about $2 trillion, $2.4 trillion. Yeah. But again, like I said, I cannot 
uh, back that up with a solid fact. I'm usually good at my facts, but this particular one I can't. But I, what I do know is the impact from D33, from District 2020, from the gaming that is coming in, is really going to be taking Dubai up there. Probably our growths will not just double. They'll become exponential. Yeah. We already have seen we are the most popular tourist destination in the world. We have the highest international traffic coming in. We have got the maximum attraction of millionaires around the world who are coming into the city. We're ticking every box in a very nice way. And this is all the vision that the city's leadership had. And it's all coming to bear fruit. And what I love about this is... Uh, the top developers in this city work hand in glove with the government. They align everything uh, that they are doing based on the plans, the D33, the 2070 and much longer term 2071, the Centennial Plan. But I, none of it is working separate from that, especially the master developers, the larger developers are all moving along with the government into that future. And it's looking extremely bright for Dubai. Speaking of numbers, um, we want to go jump to a different topic and thank you a lot for explaining this. Um, <clears throat> with every year having these developers launching, uh, let's say to be fair, 7 to 15 projects a year. And with all of the inventory coming in the market from let's say 2024 up until the next 36 months for the next 3 years. There's a lot of two voices saying, one is saying it's going to get oversupplied. They will never learn from their own mistakes. And there's another voice saying everything is based on numbers and relocation. Give us your solid opinion about these two, which one is more accurate? Okay, the numbers one is a lot more accurate. And let me give you some examples. A couple of weeks ago, an article was out. It was out in all the major newspapers that actually said Dubai is going to face a housing shortage very, very quickly. Uh, Knight Frank talked about it and they were talking about the number of handovers that we're going to see happening right up to 2028. The number that was given in that report was 82,500 units are going to come out from now till 2028. 40,000 of those units are expected to be handed over by the end of 2023. Not going to happen. Less than half of that is going to be handed over. Anyway, Ismail, it's for five years. We're talking about less than 17,000. Yeah, so it's nothing. let's assume even all the 40,000 units are handed over this year. It's not yeah. going to happen, but let's say it happens. You are left with 42,500 units from 2024 till 2028. That's an average of 8,500 units every year for the next five years. So now let's look at why this article is coming out saying that we will have a housing shortage. According to the D33 plan, the population growth from 3.5 million for Dubai, 3.5 million today is going to go to 6 million by 2033 and 7.8 million by 2040. For now, let's forget 2040. Let's just look at the next 10 years to uh, 2033. That's 2.5 million people coming in, which is an average of 250,000 people every single year. Now, we need to understand this influx of people and the inventory that's being handed over. If you look at the average family size in the UAE, it is 4.9. 4. Yeah, 4. But if 5. you look at Dubai, it is 5.3. And this can be cross-referenced and checked with the CEIC Dubai, which is the Census and Economic Information Center. So we have got 5.3 for Dubai. Let's say 5. That means when you have 250,000 people, you need 50,000 homes. Yeah, you're providing 17 to 20,000 in the best case scenario. Yeah. So there is a massive so shortage. You're talking anything between 40,000 to 45,000 shortage of homes next year. And over the next five years, you're 200,000 homes short. Because we have to remember, we are talking about all these massive launches, 20, 21, 22, 23. It's all going to get handed over and we are taking that into these numbers yeah. of handover. So now it makes sense when you understand that we are going to have a shortage of around 200,000 homes in five years. Why the developers are all on board, why they keep launching, because they understand the vision of the city, the growth model, what's going to be coming in in terms of population. And they are all launching because what they're launching today gets ready in three years, four years time to be able to offer homes to all those people coming. So we are in an absolutely brilliant spot. 
And people who want to wait today can wait. They'll pay between 30 to 80 percent more in the next three to four years. I don't think they would ever buy. These, these people would never buy. Yeah. And, and I totally got where you're coming from. And this is what we've been talking to, to lots of brokers. And they were like, everyone is saying, this is abnormal. This is not right. It has to dip. It has to crash. I totally get their point by saying, like, usually when markets go up, they go up, they stagnate a bit, they go back up, they retrace a bit, they go back up, and this is the healthy and the steady one. But when something goes up so high, it must fall down. But yet Dubai is showing, like, this is possible. We're going to be an example for countries to learn how to attract people, what to provide an order of the quality living where everyone wants to be in here, and it's gonna keep going. But it's totally understandable that everyone don't get it because like they're saying this is defeating science or economics or, or whatever, this is not normal. You know, the first, my, my take on that is two. The first thing is all these people who call economic science or whatever it may be, they're not specialists in that in the first place. Definitely. They will pass the comments like as if they are the specialists, like they are the masters of real estate. There is no way a bunch <laughs> of investors are going to be able to stand against the intelligence of the government of Dubai and that of master developers for 23 years and the future visions and plans of Dubai. There's no way they can stand up against that. The second challenge with this is I don't believe that most of the brokers in Dubai are equipped with this kind of of information Correct. so that they can educate their clients correctly. Ask most of them, most of them do not even know about the gaming authority. Most of them don't know how many units are being handled. They don't understand the plan. The D33 agenda is not clear in people's mind. The difference between Dubai and, and the rest of the world, the traditional cycles have always been there even in the Dubai of the past. This city is not the city of the past when most of the countries have got very slow moving economic agendas. Their development plans are not as aggressive. Look at most of the progressive cities in the world. You will not see this dynamism and this way of growing. That's why we shot into the number three position in the top 10 global power cities. Yeah. So real estate has to boom when your economy is growing because it's part of the natural infrastructure of every city. Retail, commercial, residential, hotels, all of them have to grow as part of an emerging economy. So we need, we cannot isolate real estate and understand it as a traditional cycle when the city is not having a traditional growth model like the rest of the world. When you are in an expansive growth model where you're aiming to be the best in the world, every industry in here is exploding accordingly and is going to grow uh, along with that uh, particular vision of the government. It's parallel. You cannot look at it in isolation. We never had this aggressive growth rate as a model in the past. Now look at the announcement. You can go for your 10-year visa after you have paid just 1 million out of the 2 million requirement. That's going to be a magnet. It's going to pull the people in and it's going to make them notice because this is on the 2 million investment in property. So it's going to make people come in. The absorption of handover units is going to be so fast, you're going to have a massive shortage which is good for the industry. From all of the areas in Dubai, do you see an area having a price softening or price correction? Because I've been getting lots of this question, like, okay, everything is up for sale, everything is gorgeous, everything is beautiful. Where do I want to buy? I'm like, it's depending on your money, it's depending on the type of the property that you want, and definitely it's depending on what's your vision. You want to stay five years, 10 years, 20 years. So tell us in your experience, which areas you feel like. Okay, in my experience, and from what I understand, is the plan that the government is creating is not for one or two areas. The city has to evolve right across. So waterfront lifestyles are growing very aggressively. Now with the Palm uh, Jebel Ali being announced and so many waterfront communities being further enhanced or enlarged, we can clearly see this development on that side. But you can see the announcements from Imar, the Creek Tower starting again. So you have this urban contemporary mix of Dubai Marina, downtown lifestyle area also exploding again. You're seeing the Dubai South 
growing. You're seeing desert communities, lagoon type of community, waterfront communities in the desert are growing. Arjan is now becoming so popular with everybody. So I don't see that any area softening at the expense of the other areas. Because when you grow your city, you need to have people at different tiers come into the city. We want the ultra high net worth to come in. For them, there will be certain areas of the city. We also want the rich people, but not necessarily the ultra high net worth. You also need the working class to come in because Dubai is welcoming the world. So when we are growing at such an aggressive pace, in every industry, I believe every area is going to have that demand. Try and find a plot. JVC is out. It's not Even available. The prices, what you prices find today have gone is, up. Is Why? Like... But again, the prices can only be put there because there are people who are willing to pay that kind of premium. I couldn't just put a price out there and not sell for 10 Definitely. years. So when you have a People need to understand that Dubai cannot be compared to any of the other top cities in the world. Those cities have evolved through hundreds of years. London is 2000 years old. Singapore has taken 80 years. But Dubai in the last 27 years has become very aggressive. So how do you compare a city like this with cities that are hundreds of years old? So that has been a slow, steady growth. We are having expansive growth and we are having continuous development in those industries or areas that were popular in the last 15 to 20 years, but the new ones are all coming in. Artificial intelligence, uh, health tourism, education. Uh, you, so just so many new types of business opportunities are coming into the city. I want to ask you a personal question. Okay. Let's say you have the option to buy a uh, poor Russia. Okay. To buy house. Okay. All right. Um, and this is personal question. This is only your opinion that doesn't reflect on anything in the market. So tell us between the two, which one would you pick and why? Okay. If it is for an investment reason to get very good returns, I would probably go on the Dubai South because Dubai South is the future of this part of the world with all the mega projects, with the airports, with the Yivu markets. Uh, with the enterprise city coming up, with the airport city, Hyperloop with, Metro, that, uh, Maktoum just, just Airport, the smart Emirates cities, moving. all of that. So from an investment perspective, I would put it there. I wouldn't want to live there because for me, it is still a little bit out there. It will no more be out there. It's a city by itself, Correct. right? But for an investment opportunity, it's going to boom. So I would go there. If I was probably looking to pick up a home for myself or a good waterfront lifestyle, I think Port Rashid would be my choice over Dubai South, especially with what's starting to happen in Maritime City now. So I believe a good waterfront lifestyle, waterfront activities, clubs, uh, you know, boat houses and maybe malls, so waterfront. The restaurants, all like I yeah. always go there, we play bowling, we do a yeah. battle as well, like that area is becoming. Yeah. Both areas wow. are going to appreciate, no question about it. But if I had to choose it from a resi residential per uh, perspective, I would go Port yeah. Rashid. Investment you would pick. Investment uh, I'd go for Dubai South. You would pick Dubai South. Okay. Now we, we want to ask something else, which is related to brokers. Okay. My favorite kind of people. <laughs> yes. And I and, uh, don't know how to say it, but it's like when I see them, it's like soldiers who went to war all day and coming back in the evening, just looking at the floor, zero energy, zero motivation. You feel like maybe there's so many rejection coming in every day, like it kind of like a break a person's mentality or spirit. How would you or what would you advise these people to do in order for them to relieve that disappointment or sadness and to just be back at it every day, day by day? What would you say to this? Okay, I think uh, it will help the brokers if they first understand the concept of rejection. There are yeah. three, four things I would give you here. First is the concept of rejection. When the client says, I'm not interested or he says, don't call me back or things like that. He's not rejecting you as a person. What he's just telling you is at this point, I'm not interested in what you have to offer me. We don't take that rejection. We take it as they're rejecting us yeah, as personally. As they see us. Yes. So they're rejecting us personally. I mean, you speak to a guy on the phone and he says, I'm not interested. And he bangs the phone on you. 
You go to another office building for a meeting in the afternoon, the elevator opens, there's someone standing there and you say, please get in. And they say, no, no, please, you get in. And you have no clue this is the guy you spoke to in the morning who yelled at you. Correct. And you're perfectly normal human beings because in your mind, you don't see this as a person who's rejected you. So the first thing is that we need to differentiate between the rejecting the opportunity and rejecting me as a person. This is the first thing. The second thing that we need to understand is leads or people that we are talking to are not sitting there saying, where were you for the last six months? I'm, I've been waiting for you to call me, Anthony. All right. Don't forget they're being harassed every day by so many brokers many of whom are absolutely unprofessional in their approach. So now when I sense I'm talking to a broker, I'm reacting not Another based way. on you. I'm <laughs> reacting based on the Mickey Mouses who called me before. A good professional broker recognizes that even if he's got that in his mind, how I speak and what I'm going to share will clear the clouds. Second thing to keep in mind. Third thing to keep in mind is when a person says no, maybe you just called him when he was in a bad headspace. My ship just sank off the coast of Africa. I'm upset. I just lost $17 million worth of cargo and you call me now. Now it's not your fault because you don't know what's happened with me. But am I in the right headspace to entertain you with a property proposition? No, I'm going to tear into you. In fact, thank you. You gave me uh, a channel or a venue bouncing back <laughs> <laughs> so we need to understand the reason why the rejection stays in the mind is this person said no was not interested did not speak to me well uh, I'm not going to call him back give him a few days he's definitely going to forget who you are so many other things is going to happen is like call him just before the weekend they're in, usually in good moods just give him a few days and call him again he might be in a different headspace and he might speak to you differently but when you do not make that second attempt you've taken away that opportunity so every time you get a no i'm not interested or that rejection and you don't get back you are left with this whole bunch of rejections which gives you the belief that selling is hard in Dubai. That's not true. You just need to understand that sometimes it needs a little bit more effort, getting back, being professional, do a little bit of research and people will get back to you. I had a person I spoke to about, it was last month. And when I spoke with the person, they said, at this point of time, we are not looking at this thing. I said, I understand. The reason I contacted you is looking at your portfolio. We've, I felt this was going to be interesting. Would you be okay if I prepared a proposal and just sent it to you? You don't even have to get back to me if it's not interesting. Would you be okay with that? They said, yeah, I don't mind that. Now, what I did is did some research on the area that they were looking in, showed how it has performed in the last two years. And when I put it in a nice little report and sent it to them with an investment plan, just a simple one page investment plan, they came back to me and said, we'd like to talk to you about this. They jumped in their mind from doing a resale of a villa to discussing a potential 33 million. We're still discussing it, but they've jumped to that place. The same person who said, we need some time and we'll come back to you. So I think it's all about your attitude and your approach, really. And if you are generally in sales, ask any of the top performers. Okay, no is something they hear all the time. But no for now simply means I'm not interested right now. Or I'm not interested in talking with you. I might be already discussing it with another broker. And I may be in an advanced stage. So it's not a rejection. I'm just well along in closing something with somebody else. So it's really going to be an attitude thing. Last point on this would be, I believe that the sales managers and the directors have a key role to play in this. My team looks up to me. Your team will look up to you. You've got the experience. You've hit some of the big numbers. How did you do that? How did you handle these? So if managers are not going to be willing to take the time to sit with their people, coach them through it, help them understand what's really happening here in the market, that's when you're going to find people who are going to struggle with accepting the rejection. You started by saying soldiers in an army. So let me give you an example of the Shogun. The Shogun were the generals from Japan many, many years ago. What I always loved about the Shogun is they were very different to most of the generals you would find. If you see most armies around the world, the, the generals were never at the front. They were always at the back and they gave the orders and they sent the foot soldiers out. The Shogun were different. The reason why the warriors, the samurais, they used to worship literally the Shogun was these guys led from front. 
So if there is a battle we are going into, the Shogun is in the front. The first cannonballs that come must go through me. Mm. The first arrows, the first flames that come, come to me, then to you, my team. So when they saw the Shogun leading from front, there was a new fire in these soldiers. And they knew that they could look up to these uh, generals because they were on the same field, blood, sweat and tears like the soldiers. That's what I love about the Shogun. I think in sales, we need Shogun managers today. People who come into the office before everybody else, people who are staying in the office because I have this one guy struggling, but he's on the phone and you just need to be there. And that's the message. I'm here for you. Managers have become lazy. They want to take the override, but they expect the foot soldiers to do the job. But if you're not there for them, why should you get the overrides? Correct. Even these managers, maybe they need someone to manage them. How to manage people? <laughs> <laughs> this is my honest opinion, to be very uh, honest. Okay. We're not talking about everyone, we're just saying in general that we've seen, as you said, this kind of practice dropping, which is leading to brokers being dropped and eventually saying, this is too tough, I cannot do it, let me check something else. See, one of the secrets of management is every team will mirror their manager. Correct. So when you have teams that are beaten, broken, confused, demotivated, the manager is probably broken and confused himself. Teams are doing well, look to the manager. It's the 80-20, it applies. You've got great managers, average managers and lousy managers. Great brokers, average and lousy. But whenever you see a team is not pulling in the right direction, look at the manager, look at the director. You will find your issue there. I worked recently with an agency where they had a couple of directors were not the best in town. And we needed to actually get rid of those directors and replace them with top-notch directors. That whole team is pulling like a rocket today. We just changed the managers. And the mentality, Absolutely. and you've seen the difference. Doctor, as always, this has been amazing. Thanks a lot for coming and see you in the next week. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you for having me. Have a great one. Thank you.